Okay, let's not start talking about the key points of this lecture. The first point that we want here is the idea of the first law of thermodynamics. It revolves around work, in which we use a W for, and heat, for which we use Q. So, the basically the first law of, the, of thermodynamics states that the change in energy of a system is equal to change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy plus the change in thermal energy. So thermal energy is energy within your system. K is related to how fast the system as a whole is moving. And obviously, you know, the potential energy is often due to gravity or could be due to electric electrical potential energy. Now, this is last semester, we just focused on these two. In mechanics, we do not worry about changes in thermal energy. We just assume thermal energy is a lost from friction would be the would be how thermal energy came in before friction. And we just took that as a loss saying energy is mechanical energy is not conserved. Now we include thermal energy for our system. And first law states that any change in the energy of the system defined by these three terms is equal to the amount of work being done on the system and the amount of Q heat transferred to the system. So we can think in this way that K, U, and E are nouns. W and Q are verbs. So in other words, we can think of there a change in the amount of kinetic energy because it's a noun. A change in amount of potential energy because it's a noun. The change in amount of thermal energy because it's a noun. But we cannot think of a change in the amount of work because work is a verb. Work is a transfer process. So it's about being transferred. Q can be think of as a verb. It's about being transferred. So it makes no sense to say delta Q. Now, as we work in thermodynamics in this unit, we're going to assume that delta K equals delta U equals zero. In other words, I have my system, okay, if this is my system, I'm, it's staying in the plane, same place. I'm not speeding the whole thing up or speeding it all up or slowing it down by itself or lifting it whole system up. I'm just letting my system stay here, okay? So there's going to be no change in the overall kinetic or potential energy in the work we're doing. Secondly, another thing you need to remember is that for thermodynamics, the work done on the system and the tree transferred to the system is positive. So in other words, work equals work external. Last semester, when you did mechanics, work was the work done by the system. This semester is the work done on the system. So it just means a sign change. We just So the way we looked, it was defined last semester was work was defined as a negative, right? We call work equals negative f dot ds last semester. This semester, work equals f dot ds because it's the work being done on the system, not the work done by the system. So if work equals the integral of f dot ds, what is force? Force can be expressed as pressure or times area. In other words, pressure is force per unit area, okay? If we have a certain force, we put it over an area, we can define pressure. So therefore, I can replace my force by pressure times the area that force is operating on. That will give me the total force. Now, if my A dot ds, okay, area, and if S is perpendicular, that's gonna give me a volume, right? A is, X, is xy, the S will be in the third direction, so that will give me the total volume. So it's equal to the integral of P dot dV. So work is equal to the integral of P dot dV. Okay, so that's basically our first law, and that's our definition of work. Now, let's look at some key concepts here now. If there is no work, if work equals zero, then the change in thermal energy is only due to heat. Okay, makes sense, right? Um, I've already said that in, in thermodynamics, we're going to assume delta U, delta K equals zero. So these guys are zero. So all my whole total change in my energy system is going to be equal to the change in thermal energy. And if work is equal to zero, then the total change in thermal energy is just going to be Q. Okay? So from this, we can then say, okay, let's define some terms. First of all, specific heat capacity. 
So Q equals delta ECH, ECH equals MC delta T. So if I have a material, hum, the mass of the material times the specific constant for that material times the change in temperature will show how much helps us to relate how much a temperature change relates to Q and which relates to a change in thermal energy. Okay? The heat of transformation, transformation is also defined this way. So Q, again, the change in thermal energy is equal to M, L, L, and then L is a specific constant. For example, the change of one gram of water from ice to liquid that would be this one gram, and then there's a, then we will find the specific constant for water to liquid, that transition. So this is for a phase change. And in a phase change, we generally assume delta P equals delta V equals zero. Okay, so this is in general for all our phases. Now, we're spending a lot of time here on ideal gases. So let's look a little bit on ideal gases now and discuss them. Okay, you recall? For ideal gases, we use a pressure versus volume diagram. And ideal gases, in an ideal gas, temperature is equal to pressure times volume divided by the number of molecules times R. So if I know the pressure and the volume, I basically also know the temperature of my system. So I can follow in a closed system by knowing where I am in the closed system, I can also find the um, temperature and the temperature change. So, therefore, at any point on the PV diagram, I know what ETH is going to be. I know how much thermal energy there's going to be, and I can get a change in thermal energy. Now, we know if I go from here to here, my total change in energy of a system is independent of path. It doesn't matter how I get there. So if I go here to here, here to here, or here to here, it doesn't really matter. The change in th energy going from one point to another point will be the same independent of the path. But I say the delta, delta ETH is independent of path, but that doesn't mean W and Q are. So W, the amount of work done and the amount of heat used depends on the path. So the cha total change in energy doesn't, but the amount of work and the amount of heat do. Okay, so let's look at some specific paths. First of all, isochoric. We talked about earlier before, that's where the volume does not change. In other words, we keep the same volume. Now we if volume does not change, then obviously from this equation, no change in volume, it means work must be zero. Okay? Okay, so there's no work done in an isochoric process. If an isobaric process, okay, work equals P delta V, right? We know that, so work equals minus P delta V. Okay, very good. So we get the work done in isobaric because delta V is the only thing changing. P is a constant. We can just pull it out of the integral. Isothermal, that's coming down this path. Now in isothermal, the temperature is going to be constant. So in other words, T is going to be constant as we go through. TI equals TF. So, but... P and V are changing continuously. So we can't just do the simple integral P dot dV. We have to make some sort of substitutions to substitute in using ideal gas law. We can get rid of, because T is going to be constant, we got to write either. We have to replace P by the equivalent. So I would use ideal gas law to say P equals T over V times N times R, and I'll substitute it in, and I'll end up getting the total work being done this, minus NRT LN VF over VI. Again, we're making use of the ideal gas law to do that. 
The third type is an adiabatic process. And we'll discuss that very briefly later, okay? Um, adiabatic means there's absolutely no change in thermal energy in the process, okay? All right. Next, heat. As I said, so the change is system energy independent path, but these guys aren't. So isochoric, work equals zero, okay? So the change in thermal energy is going to be Q, and we discussed earlier that's going to be N times a constant at constant volume, delta T. So we have the, a constant to relate between the change in temperature and the change in thermal energy. We have I, isobaric is the second type. For an isobaric transition, that's where our pressure is going to be the same. In this case, we use a different version of C. So Q equals NCP delta T. Okay, and as a result, work is going to, because ETH has to be the same each time, right? So it's going to be ETH minus, we know the same change of temperatures, um, so this is a total change in thermal energy, so the work done has to be the difference between that, which is equal to minus P dot dV. For the isothermal process, the change in thermal, thermal energy is going to be zero, okay? Isothermal, no thermal change, and we from here, right, we know here that thermal energy change is related to change in temperature. So Q must be equal to minus W, right? Because there's no change in thermal energy. I've already said it using this much work, so Q must be the opposite of how much work. So we must take out the same amount of heat. We have, must take out the same amount of energy as we put in by work, or if we take out energy by work, we have to put in enough heat to compensate on it. So the total thermal energy change is zero, and the total systems energy is zero. And finally, adiabatic, where I said Q equals zero. Therefore, the total change in thermal energy is only due to the work being done. And that's going to be NCV delta T again. Because, again, delta TH has, is independent of the path. Okay? So these, for ideal gap... And re but remember, this only applies for ideal gases, okay? Which, as we saw here, is this big area over for, for water. It would be this huge area, basically somewhere about here. We could say it's this area. Mm, just along from the, see this border, along this border, not right on the border, but just a little bit away from the border and all the way in this corner. So this corner up here, this will all be ideal gas, just as long as we don't, get too close to the phase transition line. These ideal gas law will work, ideal gas model will work very well. There's a few more, one more concept that we'll be learning in this chapter, and that will be heat transfer mechanisms. Um, there are three different types of heat transfer mechanisms. Conduction, in which two things are touching each other. So the heat goes directly from one to another thing. So if I touch a hot cup, I will get by, con this is con conduction, the heat will enter to my hands. Convection. Convection would be due to like wind blowing. So there I'm taking heat away this way. And radiation is like how the sun heats the earth. How we go through space, we don't, it's just, it's done by electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so these are the key methods that we are talking about for heat transfer mechanisms. So after this, we'll start moving into the, um, we'll move into our PowerPoint presentation next, probably after a Kahoot. <laughs>